All right, so Gary, you've got a question about using the uh, fuzzy logic uh, for combining yeah, two different indicators. Um, all right, so you want to, yeah, so I guess the, the MACD and the, the stochastic definitely um, kind of makes a good case for uh, fuzzy logic. And then, uh, all right, so the follow-up um, question to that would be, uh, I guess, using the uh, sliding scales uh, on the solver nodes um, as well. So, all right. Good. Let's pull a chart up here and take a look at that. Um, so, all right. Well, I just have now my stock chart here has a stochastics and a MACD on it. So uh, we'll use that. All right. And let me turn off the markers there. There. All right. So to kind of start with a a brief explanation here of what the fuzzy logic is. Um, so if we open up our indicator list and if we take a look at Bloodhound, you'll notice that Bloodhound's plots, right, its output has a long confidence and a short confidence. Right, so the fuzzy logic, what its purpose is, is to um, calculate a confidence level um, a, you know a, a percent a confidence level which is really uh, actually a percentage so um, all right so you'll notice that um, in bloodhound's output right bloodhound ranges from zero to one uh, one being 100 percent you know and zero being zero percent confidence level right so the fuzzy logic right it gives you a confidence level in a percentage as as a percentage here uh, ranging you know from zero percent going all the way up to 100 percent or one there right? so that's what the fuzzy logic is um, and let's see if we change the scaling here And for some reason, it does not allow me to change the scaling. I guess there's a little glitch. Uh, there we go. Let's see if we can. Huh. Um, there, let's stretch this out here a little bit. Well, all right. Ninja's not allowing me to scale this sub panel here, but. Um, see if I can all right well at least we can see um, the long output here so the positive one we can't see down below the negative one but um, you can see this green line here so that green line that's the 80 percent confidence level um, you know so we just kind of uh, arbitrarily set a um, Kind of a, a working starting point using 80 percent as a strong enough confidence level um, to be considered you know as your conditions being close enough to being met you know so 80 percent is the uh, kind of the threshold you know for your for your for the confidence in your system to be considered uh, you know a, a a signal right so when bloodhounds output crosses this line here, this 80%, that's when you get the racing stripes coming out of Bloodhound. So, um, all right, this will make, uh, this will all make more sense here in just a minute once we get something plugged into Bloodhound and working here. So, all right, so let's uh, first put a name in here. So, and welcome to the first. All right. And I'll start working on a new logic template here. So all right, so we'll 
just generate a fuzzy logic example. So, and let's see, I noticed um, you would actually like to use the ergodic. Um, I'm guessing the ergodic instead of the MACD or instead of the stochastic. Um, <clears throat> So let me get the ergodic on here. All right, and I'll just use the standard settings for that. So how about, actually, I guess uh, we'll replace, okay, the MACD. Yeah, all right, so I'll take the MACD out and stretch these other two up. Okay, so I'm going to, start with the uh, stochastics here um, so this this one's a little easier to visualize the fuzzy logic with so we'll get bloodhound back open and um, so uh, what I'm going to do with the stochastics is I'm going to use a threshold solver and um, so when when the stochastic gets to the 80% uh, or the 80 line and also when the stochastic reaches down to the 20 line as well those will kind of be our, our threshold levels um, you know in which uh, blood hell will give us a hundred percent confidence output and in between and so when the stochastic is in between we'll see the fuzzy logic of bloodhounds kind of rising up and down with the uh, stochastics so so let's grab a threshold solver to start with and we're gonna plug the stochastics in here all right we'll do a, an 80 20 uh, threshold level on the stochastics so I'm gonna put 80 in a and put um, and put uh, actually let's see um, yeah I'll put 20 in E um, and let's see I also need some numbers in between um, so let's see Yeah, okay, we'll stack it like this. And then the output, um, so we're going to generate a long output when the stochastic is greater than 80. When it's greater than 80. Um, also when it's at 80. And then we'll also generate a short output when the... Um, Stochastics is um, uh, at zero or at twenty, like so. And let's see. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I haven't plugged my stochastics in yet. So I just have an SMA in there. All right, let's go put the stochastic in. All right, I'm just going to use the standard uh, settings there. And um, let's see, we'll look at the percent K there. I mean, percent D, sorry. Let me just double check what I have um, showing on the chart. Yeah, and I'm displaying D on the chart. And... In Bloodhound, we have the D plot selected there. All right, good. Um, and oh, I missed one more output on the short outputs there. Okay, so you can see. So back to the threshold solver here for the short output. So when I'm at 20, I have a one. At 20, at one, and then zero. Um, 
and then um, and then zero I have a one here um, and so now we can take a closer look at Bloodhound's output now you'll notice that Bloodhound's output matches it's gonna be matching what the stochastic is doing um, exactly there and so the way the threshold solver is kind of generating this fuzzy logic is right you'll notice that in our threshold levels we're going from 80 to 20 right going from 80 to 20 and so in our outputs on the long output we're going so when the, the stochastic is at 20 our output is zero zero percent and then once the stochastic gets to 80 our output is going to be one or 100 percent so in between 20 and 80 bloodhound is making an interpolation right it, that's where in between 20 and 80 is where bloodhound is generating a fuzzy logic uh, interpolation there so um, so if we look um, like at this point right here on the stochastic uh, that's you know approximately 50 um, you know it looks like 47 there and actually it's we'll slide this over here all right so we can see um, the stochastic is at 46 and um, our long output is going to be pretty close to 20 uh, to 46 and so will our short output it'll be pretty close to, to 46 right 46 is almost in the middle you know it's pretty close to 50 um, right and so 50 would be the halfway point between 80 and 20 same thing with the short output so the short output um, the threshold solvers and you know is making a um, interpolation between 20 up to 80 right here. so at 20 we have a, a one an output of one or 100 percent confidence and at 80 we have an output of zero confidence right and so both the short output and the long output you know they're both gener generating they're both calculating their interpolation between 20 and 80 right and 20 and 80 right so um, so essentially the the um, closer our stochastic gets to 80 we can see the the higher the long output rises right the the more confidence um, the the higher the confidence level are that our long output um, generates there right the closer the stochastic gets to 80 the more the long confidence rises right and that's because on the long output here when we're at 80 we're saying well that's hundred percent of our condition being met so for one um, right? and then at 20 we're saying there's zero percent of our confidence uh, being met right um, and then, of course, the um, it's it's the opposite or the reverse condition is being calculated when the stochastic goes down to 20. Then we can see that the short side, right, the short side gets closer and closer to 100% as the stochastic gets closer and closer to our our 20% uh, line there. So let me actually adjust the scaling on the stochastic there. There we go. So now in our stochastic, yeah, we can see the 20 and the 0%, and then the 80 and the 100%. So the closer the stochastic, again, the closer the stochastic gets to 20, um, the closer the short output will get to 100% confidence. Right, and that was determined here by our short output setting. So when our stochastic is at 20, that's considered 100% com 
um, confidence being met. So all the way from 20 down to zero, like so. All right, so that's kind of a, a, a brief overview uh, of the fuzzy logic and how it's working. Um, and so, you know, this, this interpolation between 20 and 80 in the threshold solver, um, well, all the solvers actually kind of have this, um, have the ability to do a, you know, interpolation between two different, two different settings, let's say, you know, two different levels, two different settings, right? It all depends on what the solver is actually doing there, so forth. Um, Let's see. So for the um, uh, for the ergodic, um, again, the ergodic is. Um, let's see. It's oscillating around a zero line. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's oscillating up and down around a, a zero line there. Um, so let's see. Let's. So I noticed that the ergodic has two two lines here, right? Which are some kind of a threshold lines there. So I'm going to see what those lines are set at. So 25 uh, and negative 25. All right. So we'll use another threshold solver and use these 25 levels here in the threshold solver here. So let's grab another threshold solver. Plug that in. All right, so there's our threshold levels, 25 and negative 25. So I will go 25 here, and we're going to leave B, C, and D at 0. And then E will go negative 25 there. Okay, so for a long output, um, right, we'll say once we get to our, you know, once we get, once the ergodic gets to its 25 level, we'll say, you know, that's that's what we're looking for. So that's 100% confidence level of that condition being met. All right, 100% confidence that condition's met. Um, and if it's at zero, you know, so if it's you know in between 25 down to zero, then the zero will be a zero confidence being met. And then for the short output, we'll use the negative 25 there as our confidence levels, our 100% confidence for for the short side, right? For a short condition, like so. Um, and okay, next step, let's not forget to put our ergodic indicator in there. All right, there we go. And I'm just going to use the default settings, um, which, yeah, on the chart, it's 3, 5, and 14. So 3, 5, and 14 looks good. Um, and then let's see, the next one we need to select which plot. Um, Let's see, which plot is the histogram there? Um, mm -hmm. um, it's probably not the signal. I'm guessing the sig signal is usually the, the red smooth line. So let's go with the main. Um, I'll go with the main there. And um, that looks like it's doing it. Yep. So actually, I'm going to open up the indicator and just double check here. Um, let's see. Yeah, the main is that black line there, which actually I'll probably set this to gray so we can see it on the black chart. And there we go. So yeah, so the main plot looks like it's sitting right on top of the histogram there. Yeah, okay, so that looks good. Um, and let's grab another arrow. So 
remember in our solver we set this this 25 level as our threshold in inside bloodhound so let's get that open again here all right so uh, one of our threshold levels is 25 and the other one's negative 25 and so as soon as that ergodic reaches 25 then we can see bloodhound's output reaches 100% right 100% confidence and as the ergodic is kind of floating around in between 25 and negative 25 um, well actually uh, for the short side when the ergodic is in between 25 and 0 25 and 0 there right we can see the long output is also gonna float float around from 0 to 25 right from 0 to 25 there So um, looking at our long output, so the long output, the long output ends at zero. So at zero, we have a zero for the output. And then when we get closer to 25, we're going to get closer to 100% output, like so. Um, now, so with both of these, um, both of these right having a fuzzy logic output now if we combine them in a and node essentially what the and node is going to do is it's going to take the greater the greater of these two solvers here so the outputs from these solvers the and node is going to take the greater of them or, I'm sorry, it's going to take the minimum of them, sorry. Whichever output has the smaller, smallest output, that essentially is what gets passed through uh, a AND node here. So let's take a look here. Um, so it kind of looks like right here, our ergodic there, uh, well, actually it's kind of hard to say. Um, because our stochastic is really close to 20 as well. Um, yeah, so it's kind of hard to say, you know, which, you know, is it the ergodic or is it the um, stochastic that's generating this really uh, low output for the long side, this long output here. Um, but we can see that when bloodhound reaches a hundred percent here that um well yeah the the ergodic is above its 25 level right so the ergodic is generating a hundred percent confidence above that 25 level but our stochastic hasn't reached 80 yet right so we have to wait until we get to this bar here um before Right, so this bar is when this stochastic finally gets to its 80 or 100% confidence on the fuzzy logic side. And then that, that is when the bloodhound's output can finally get to 100%. So we got the ergodic above 25. So the ergodic's at its 100% output, um, you know, ahead of time. And so the ergodic is just waiting for the stochastic to get to its 80 level to generate this 100% 100% confidence output there right so that's what the and node is doing is um, the and node is taking the the smaller output um, because of the stochastics um, right since the ergodic has already reached 25 and has surpassed 25 so the ergodics trying to out is outputting 100%, but the stochastic is waiting to get caught up there. Um, 
And then that, so when the stochastic gets to 80, that's when Bloodhound's output finally gets to 80, right? And that's from using the, the AND node. So if we use a OR node, like so, the OR node outputs the maximum. Uh, so the maximum value of either solver, the OR node will output the maximum value. So we can see things change uh, quite a bit here. So now Bloodhound's output reaches 100% as soon as the ergodic reaches its 25 level, which is way before the stochastic gets up to 80. Right? The stochastic is still down here around 50, just below 50. Um, but the ergodic reached its 25 level, and then with the OR node, you'll get a 100% confidence level as soon as the ergodic reaches its its level or you know basically whichever indicator you know reaches its threshold level first that's that's the um, that's the indicator that will generate a 100% uh, confidence level from bloodhound's output when you're using an or node Okay, Gary, I see I see your settings there. Um, okay, let's see what you got here, Gary. So, uh, all right, so following up on the stochastic, um, let's see, is the negative 25. So the negative 25 is on the ergodic, uh, not the stochastics. So, um, but let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the ergodic here. So let's connect that guy up. So we have um, in our threshold levels, we have negative 25 and we have less than negative 25. And let's see. So right here, the ergodic doesn't quite get to that negative 25 level. And we can see Bloodhound's output hasn't quite reached the 80% threshold level. Let me see if, there we go. Now Ninja's going to let me scale Bloodhound there. So I'll scale this so we can see we can see the positive one output from Bloodhound and we can also see the negative one right down there. So let's scroll back on the chart and oh here we go. Not too far. So right right there's our negative 25 on the on the um, ergodic. And then we can see here uh, these bars here, Bloodhound has reached its 100% um, confidence output on these bars here, where the ergodic is um, surpassing negative 25 there. All right, I hope that clears it up there for you. So, uh, yeah, all right, so Gary's commenting about Bloodhound's output. Yeah, so, um, you know, just for the sake of visualization, you know, um, you know, the way we visualize things on a chart, um, you know, internally, Bloodhound is, you know, calculating the short output as a positive value. Again, going from 0% zero per, zero to a positive 100%. But in order to visualize it correctly on the chart, uh, just before uh, it gets plotted on the, on the chart, you know, internally, Bloodhound reverses the output to a negative to a negative um, value, right? So it's you know, so it's calculating internally a positive, you know, a positive 100% confidence output, but then at the last minute, it it um, it multiplies it uh, into a negative, so that way, you know, visually we can see a down red, you know, making an an opposite. Um, right generating an opposite look of the long side right so a red down because you know when we're trading shorts are always going down so right so we so the so the short output you know is going downward just to kind of match the trading direction so um right yeah so so the the negative one the negative one output on the short side is just for visual reference so yeah so 
for so for your short outputs here, yeah, you don't want to use negative negative ones. You know, just always keep your outputs as a positive value there. So, okay, so Frank, you want to? Oh, that's right. And Gary, you also had a question about using weighting as well. So um, let's use the AND node. All right, so the AND node here. Um, and we can go back to, well, let's, let me find a spot. OK, I think this area will work for a demonstration here. So we can see the stochastic is um, pretty close to 80. Um, you know, in one spot, a couple of bars there, it actually gets to 80 and above. Um, and then over here, we can see the ergodic um, is, for the most part, below its 25. And so what we'll do is we'll give the stochastics more weighting here. Um, and all right, yeah, so looking at Bloodhound's output, what's keeping the output below, you know, below the, its signal level, right, what's keeping Bloodhound's output kind of down, down, uh, you know, below, yeah, below the 80, uh, you know, for, for signaling, what's keeping it down is our ergodic, right? So the ergodic is below its 25 level, right? So it's it's lower than where the stochastic is, right? The stochastic is really close to its 80 level, but the ergodic is right down below. Uh, it's, it's significantly more below its its 25 threshold level. So let's kind of stretch this out here to exaggerate it. So. So I can use the sliders to give more weighting to the stochastic, which will then increase the output here of Bloodhound. It'll, it'll increase Bloodhound's output there. All right, so we'll note, so take a look in here, and we'll see Bloodhound's output beginning to increase. So let's shrink that over. So let's go to the AND node. And so here's the slider for our stochastic um, solver. And, um, and so let's increase, uh, actually, it's already at 100%, at so I will use, um, use these adjustments over here and so as I increase we can see with every click we can see Bloodhound's output the long side is getting higher and higher as I give more weighting to it so let's see actually that's probably what will work better is um, what typically uh, what will give you a more dramatic visual effect using the sliders would be the ratio node. So we'll use the ratio node. So now as I increase the weighting for the stochastic, yeah, now we can see, we see um, the output, right, Bloodhound's output is matching the stochastic more and more, right? As you can see, the Bloodhound's, you know, fuzzy output there, it's beginning to match the stochastic far more than it's matching the ergodic. All right, so we can see like this little peak right there in the ergodic and Bloodhound's output uh, is just kind of ignoring that peak 
on the ergodic, but the output is matching the right the the sine wave of the stochastics uh, a lot more than it's matching the ergodic output as I increase the weighting for the stochastics. Right. So, um, right now the these sliders here these kind of set um, this actually will reduce the weighting so as I move the slider over right so for the stochastic so the stochastic weighting now ranges from uh, right 0 to 41 percent and so now we can see the output now matches matches the ergodic right it looks a lot closer to the um, ergodic output here than it does the stochastic right so like right here we can see a little bit uh, a little bit of weighting coming from the stochastic right so this long output right there those little that little bit of long output uh, we can see the ergodic has no long output at all right there all right so this long output must be coming from the stochastic right here right so our stochastic has a little peak and so therefore with our weighting of the stochastic knocked down to 41 percent then um, the right bloodhounds output um, the long output is greatly reduced as well you know it's reduced for the stochastic all right because there's definitely no long output from the ergodic there on these bars so, and then as I bring this back to normal like so now we can see the output a little normalized so actually probably the output coming from the stochastic would look something like this right it would be rounded it, the long output would be rounded just as the stochastic has this little rounded hump right but because of the ergodic having this little spike here so you take the stochastic long output combine it with the little ergodic spike so you get this spike overlaid on top of the stochastic output there so from the ratio node all right so frank is asking how would weighting be applied um only when values of an indicator are between certain values um let's see well um so the weighting um the weighting is only going to apply actually the, the weighting really only has an effect um when your indicator is between two certain levels so for example right, let's just take the stochastics as a simple example right so on the stochastics we're looking you know we're looking to see when the stochastic is above 80 or below 20 right so for the long output we're looking for um, right we're, we're generating a long output when we're at 80 or above or when we're at 20 or less, 20 or below. Right. So you know, once 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 the output, uh, once the solver's output has reached 100%, that's it. You've maxed out at 100%. So the weighting is only going to have um, a. It's only going to have an effect, really, between the 80 and 20 values, right? So it's only when our stochastic is in between 20 and 80 here does the weighting really have an effect. So, although, well, actually, it's not entirely true. Um, so um, it's not entirely true, but because the the weighting, the weighting just it takes the output and 
um, you know, it's, it's just a multiplier. So it just takes the output and just adds a multiplier, um, you know, increasing, uh, just kind of adds, adds a multiplication factor, uh, you know, so for either, you know, increasing the output amount, the output value, or, you know, or we're decreasing the output, uh, decreasing the output value. So, um, so I guess, um, yeah, so to, to apply the weighting to an indicator between certain values, um, yeah, that, the, yeah, the weighting doesn't, as you can see, you know, the weighting doesn't have any settings to, um, to relate it directly to an indicator value. Right. So, um, yeah, so if for some reason, if your indicator needs to have some adjustment in between, you know, two threshold levels, um, you know, that would best be done by the indicator itself. You know, really the indicator needs to be rewritten for those adjustments that you need, right? So, you know, Bloodhound will uh, apply a general kind of weighting, you know, to to a solver's output, you know, but Bloodhound is not designed to specifically manipulate any particular indicator's output. So, let's see. So Gary's asking, uh, yeah, same fuzzy logic process. If you had three indicators. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so, um, let's see here. Yeah, I don't know. just trying to think of something a little more interesting, but you know, I guess uh, I'll just keep it simple. I'll just do the MACD above or below zero. Um, well, that that's actually that that wouldn't have any fuzzy logic. Um, so let's see if one and negative one works. Um, There we go. Okay, so MACD of 0.1. So there we go. Getting a little, little bit of fuzzy logic output there. Um, so, yeah, yeah. There we go. Um, all right. Yeah. So you know, same concept. You know, if I throw a, another indicator in there, such as the MACD, um, you know, I can give the MACD more more weighting than all the rest and right so I max the weighting out um, there right so if we look at the ratio node and then if we look at the actual uh, solver um, <laughs> right there we go yeah we can see what see that the yeah we maxed out the the solver there so um, yeah keep in mind um, one thing to note is that uh, this weighting um, this weighting here the sliders actually modifies the 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 solvers output there all right so if this if this solver is plugged into the or node right then we can see the MACD Right, the MACD solver, it, its weighting also is maxed out at nine. All right, so the slider, so the, the the weighting, the sliders, actually modify the solver itself. It actually modifies the node itself. All right, so like right, so, the point is, if you need this MACD solver, 
used somewhere else in your system, but you don't want a weighting applied to it, then you'll need to have a second one. You'll need to have two solvers, um, two of the same solvers, you know, so one solver will have the weighting applied to it. One solver, yeah, will have this weighting applied to it, and the other solver, you know, will not have a weighting applied to it that you can use elsewhere in your system without that weighting on it. So, um, yeah, in the next iteration of Bloodhound, these weightings will actually apply only to, will only apply to the input of a logic node instead of actually modifying the, the solver itself. All right, uh, let me take a look at the questions here. Uh, let's see, yeah, so Frank is asking, why did I do the weighting at the uh, logic nodes versus doing it um, at the solver? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could do it either place, right? Um, it's, you know, just, it's just um, when people, when, when you're doing weighting, it's typically at, the logic node point, uh, right? So the the, the classic um, example of utilizing weighting, the classic example would be like with the ratio node, and you want and you want one of your solvers, you know, for example, we're picking on the MACD here, so uh, so we're wanting one of the solvers or one of the indicators to have more importance than the other two indicators. And, and, you know, that importance is typically at a logic node. So that's why I um, demonstrate it at the logic node. Right. So that's usually kind of visually where most people would think of, of you know, adjusting the importance of, of, you know, one of their indicators over the other indicators would be at, you know, at a logic node where you're combining, you know, all of your indicators together. So, you know, whether it be a ratio or an AND node, you know, usually you're thinking, okay, you know, at my AND node, you know, where I'm combining my stochastic and ergodic, you know, that's usually where you consider thinking about, oh, you know what, my ergodic has more importance, so let me adjust the weighting there for the ergodic. So, so that's why I always demonstrate it on the logic nodes. So, um, but yeah, either way, you know, I can click on the ergodic here and we can see the, the weighting's been adjusted there too, right? So there, I set it back to one. And if I go to the AND node, all right, I can see it is set back to one as well. All right, well, with that, um, I guess I'll say have a good rest of your day and uh, Hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow uh, in the uh, Blackbird workshop. So, all right, gentlemen, have a good one. Um, if I don't see you tomorrow, then have a great weekend. All right, bye-bye, guys.